right, let's go to God's Word today. Are you ready? Genesis 22, if you've got a Bible, grab it, open it to Genesis 22. Maybe you want to follow along on the screen behind me or use the YouVersion Bible app. Uh, that is fine as well. Let's go to Genesis 22 in verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he, God said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Wow. As, as we jump into God's word today, we're going to find ourselves in one of the most difficult stories in all of Scripture. We've got God, who's a good God, we know that, but for some reason this good God is asking a father to take his son to the mountains and offer him as a sacrifice. Now, in case you're not understanding what God is, is saying here, God's not saying, hey, Abraham, I want you to take your boy and, and go to the mountains and have some bonding time. God ain't saying that. He's, he's saying, Abraham, I want you to take your boy to the mountains and unalive him and then burn the evidence. Somebody say, yikes. Yikes. I cannot even imagine. Well, I mean, as a father of six kids, I'm not saying I've never been tempted but, uh, no, I mean, I can't imagine if God gives you this kind of directive, how do you respond to that? I mean, wow. Let's talk about the players in our story here today. Number one, we've got Abraham. Abraham is a special guy. He really is a special guy. Because out of all the people on the planet at the time, God chose Abraham to become the father of this new spiritual race. Abraham is literally called the friend of God. Isn't that an awesome title? Man, I, I would love for someone to say that about me, that Dave is the friend of God. That's what we're told about Abraham. He's that close to the Lord that he would be called the friend of God. And God told his friend Abraham that he and his wife Sarah would have a son, but instead of having a baby, they actually just waited. <laughs> and they waited. And they waited some more, and they waited until they got really, really old, and, and they began to think that this son of promise was never going to come. In, in fact, they, they get so old that they, they almost had given up. Sarah becomes a mom at 90 years of age. That's an old mama. Right? 90 years of age. Can you imagine what kind of games they played at Sarah's baby shower? <laughs> Like hide the dentures and pass the jello. I mean, it was, it was great. Her gifts included huggies for the baby and depends for, all right, no, I should move on. Uh, but seriously, Sister Sarah here is 90 years old and her husband, Abe, he's not younger. He's older. He's 100. And they got a newborn baby. Wow. They have this baby boy and they name him Isaac. Do you know what Isaac means? It means laughter. Because if you're 190 having a, having a baby, you're going, you got to laugh. You're going to cry. You're going to go crazy, right? So they name him Laughter. Let's talk about Isaac a little bit. He's the promised child. This couple has been waiting on him for decades. And there was a time that God actually took Abraham outside, out of his tent in the middle of the night. You know how a couple weeks ago we were all out there to see the northern lights? Well, that's, that's where Abraham was. He's, he's outside, and God says, I want you to look up. He says, Abraham, you see all the stars? Can you count them? And of course, Abraham can't count them. He says, Abraham, one day your descendants will be more than these stars. And, and Abraham is thinking, what in the world? How can this be? And, and, and that vision or that prophecy, that promise could only come to pass through this promised son, Isaac. How much do you think Abraham loved Isaac? He's loving him big, right? I mean, this, this is his child. This is his, this is his future. This is his world. But now God, the same God that promised this son, is asking him to take this son to the mountains and take his life. I cannot imagine what Abraham and Sarah are going through. The God who blessed them is now asking them to do the unthinkable. Verse 3, so Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. 
Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and he saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, he said, stay here with the donkey, the lad, Isaac and I, we're going to go yonder and worship and we'll come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand or probably like a fire starter and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? What a, what a question for Isaac to ask. You see, Isaac knows a thing or two about worship. He, he knows that his, his father just told the servants, hey, me and the lad, we're going over here to worship. And, and Isaac knows in his day that if there's going to be proper worship, there's going to be a sacrifice. And so Isaac starts to walk through his mind. He's got a worship checklist. And he said, what are some things that we're going to need in order to go over yonder and worship? And he's like, well, we need some wood. Check. Got it. We, we, need, a, we need a fire starter. He got one of them little starter logs from Walmart, right? He got that thing. Check it's on the list. He's like, oh, we're going to need to kill the sacrifice. We're going to need a knife. Okay, check. We got the knife. But then he's like, but dad, hold on. <laughs> we are missing the most important element of worship. Hey, dad. Where is the lamb? Will you say that with me today? Say, where is the lamb? Verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together and they came to the place of which God had told them. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Oh, again, it is so hard for us to comprehend this. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. How many thankful for this angel right now? I'll tell you who's really thankful for the angel, Isaac. <laughs> Isaac is really thankful for the angel. And he said, here I am, verse 12. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad. Don't do anything to him, for now I no, oh, I like that. Now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its thorn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead. Everybody say instead. Instead of the son. Verse 14, and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh. And it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. This is a, a story with a roller coaster of emotions. Y'all, God never intended for Abraham to slay his son. But he did send him there as a test. And sometimes God will test even us with the things that we love the most. Abraham thankfully passes the test and God provides the lamb. Now not only is this a test for Abraham, but it is also what we might call a prophetic act as it points to something that will happen to God's only son, Jesus Christ, in the New Testament. If you're new to the Bible, I want you to know that as you're reading through the Old Testament, you will see things that we call types and shadows of something that will later be fulfilled in the New Testament. You follow me? It's not, it's not exactly what happens. Like we don't have an account exactly of Old Testament and New Testament, but there's similar circumstances and there are enough similarities that God is showing us that these two events that happen in the Old Testament and then later in the New Testament, they're not merely coincidences, but they are a part of God's sovereign plan. And he gives us these types and these shadows to remind us that he alone is God Almighty. Do you know that right now, God is the one who writes history. And so even when this world seems out of control, we do not have to fear because there is a sovereign God who has the whole world in his hands. So here in Genesis 22, we see that Isaac is a type 
or a shadow of Jesus Christ. He is an Old Testament figure that points to the New Testament fulfillment in Jesus. Let me just quickly, I'm just going to run through a few. There's dozens of them, but I'm just going to give you a few of the similarities. Number one, both require, both Isaac and Jesus require a miraculous conception. Again, Sarah's 90 years old. If a 90-year-old woman is going to conceive a baby, it's going, it's going to take some help from the Lord. <laughs> Amen? And, and Mary is a virgin girl, and in order for her to get pregnant, it's going to take a miracle from God. Number two, neither Isaac nor Jesus deserve death. Isaac hadn't done anything that called for his death. And then when we look at the life of Jesus before he was sent to the cross, in one night he went through six different legal trials. And at the end of all that, at the conclusion, you know what they said? We find no fault in this man. They were both innocent. Number three, both of the men, Isaac and Jesus, were to be sacrificed by their own fathers. Number four, both men were obedient even to the point of death. Listen, when Isaac is laid on that altar and, and Abraham raises that knife to him, Isaac is not a toddler, y'all. Isaac is, is a young man. He's probably 16 to 20 years of age, and he could probably take Daddy Abraham, who's now 100 years old. Right? But we have, we have no record of him putting up a struggle. We have no record of him putting up a fight. And when Jesus Christ was on the cross, the Bible tells us that any moment he could have called a legion of angels to come and bring him down off of that cross. But instead, he humbled himself to the perfect submission of his father. Number five, Isaac and Jesus both had the wood required for the sacrifice placed upon their backs. Isaac was to build an altar and the wood of Jesus was to build a cross. Number six, both men had a three-day journey. Abraham and, and, uh, and Isaac journeyed to that place that he was going to be sacrificed. It was a three-day journey. It was there that Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and then he journeyed into death and darkness for three days before rising again. Number seven, let's talk about the place that these sacrifices were to happen. The place that Isaac was taken to this mountain range was a mountain range called Moriah. Hundreds of years ago, in, or, or hundreds of years later, in that same place, that's where the temple would be built and Jesus would be sacrificed just right outside the city in that exact same mountain range. But in the New Testament, we call it Calvary. Y'all, this is no coincidence. This is the hand of God. Number eight, both stories remind us that God will provide. God provided a replacement for Isaac so that he did not have to die. And God provided Jesus as our replacement, dying in our place so that we could have eternal life. How many thankful for that today? <laughs> Friends, I could, I could go on and on this morning, but... This story is here to remind us that God's plan for salvation was no accident. Jesus was no plan B. God had provided for our salvation even before Adam sinned. He's a good God and we're secure in his hands. This story is also provided so that we can see just how powerful and important the written word of God is. Y'all, we cannot set aside the Bible. It is the very foundation of our faith. Can you say amen? But this story also reminds us of something else. And it's found in the question of this young man named Isaac. Remember when Isaac was going through his checklist and he was thinking about some things that were needed for worship and he says dad we, we need a knife okay I got that and we need some wood I got, we got that we need some fire starter we got that but then he gets to the most important element of worship and he realizes that something is missing and, and Isaac says hey dad where is the lamb where is the lamb and y'all I've had Isaac's question rolling around in my heart and in my mind all week long. Where is the lamb? As I have watched events taking place in the Worldwide Church of Jesus Christ over these past few weeks, I, 
I can't help but wonder and, and hear Isaac's question echoing from that mountain range. Where is the lamb? You see, Isaac knew that the lamb, Jesus, is supposed to be the central focal point of worship. And without the lamb, we really have nothing to worship at all. I won't say that again. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, is supposed to be the central focal point of worship. And if you remove the Lamb, we really have nothing to worship at all. I don't know if you know it or not, but over the past couple of weeks, we have witnessed another one of our major Christian denominations abandon the Word of God choose to redefine Jesus to fit their own political and cultural ideologies. A denomination with a rich heritage that has done some incredible works throughout the world, they have decided that they can worship without the Lamb. I've watched some of their live stream of their general conference, and this is a conference of their leaders who would come together and vote on really important issues and, and things that would decide the future of the church. And, and I watched this live stream, and I'm just amazed because people, delegates, leaders, not just church attenders, these are leaders from around the world would come to a pulpit like this, and they would pick up a microphone, and they would state their names, okay? But then they would, they would say things like they would state their skin color. Like, like, in case you couldn't tell the guy was black, he would say, I'm black. And, and, and in case you couldn't tell that the woman was white, she would, she would say, I'm, I'm white. And then they would go to great lengths to state their pronouns. And then they would go to great lengths to talk about their gender identity and their sexual orientation. Yo, I, I've been to a lot of church conferences. I've never been asked these things. Because these things didn't matter because we weren't there to worship ourselves. We were there to worship the Lamb. <laughs> and, and then this conference had entire groups of people whose job it was to monitor everyone's speech. To make sure you didn't say offensive things like calling God Father. Y'all, Jesus called God Father. And when his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, he said, pray like this, our Father. But in this particular denomination, apparently, <laughs> apparently that's against the rules now. This group of folks went on to vote on very important matters and they redefined what marriage is. And then in one of the highlights of the conference, they formed a conga line and they danced to the song Love Train, which I'm going to demonstrate right now if our band could come out. No, no we don't know it. You might say, Pastor, we're not a part of that denomination. Why, why, why do you care? Why don't we just mind our own business? Well, because it's not just something that's happening afar off. And listen, some of us are already uncomfortable. You're going to get more uncomfortable. There are people in positions of power right here in our own community. Politicians and college professors and school teachers and business people and pastors and priests who have adopted this same type of progressive Christianity and they are using their positions of power and influence to spread it in our community. And today I want our church to understand the strategies that are being used to recreate Jesus in their own image. Progressive Christianity is one that simply uses Jesus as a mascot. He's not the centerpiece of worship and his words carry very little authority. They take our Lord and they redefine him to fit their own agendas. To some, Jesus has become a bobblehead that says yes to anything that our culture wants to do. 
I heard a politician this week use the name of Christ to justify supporting a sinful lifestyle, declaring that we are just supposed to love and affirm everyone in the name of tolerance. And here's the kicker. If you don't agree with him, then you're dumb. <laughs> and you just need to be educated. Reminded me of this passage, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Watch this first half. Having a form of godliness but denying its power from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. Verse 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Y'all, I'm not an enemy of education. My two daughters graduated college yesterday. yesterday. We're proud of them. We're proud of, all the, uh, we're proud of all the graduates here today. But do you know that there is a worldly knowledge that is contrary to the word of God? And you can have all the degrees you want, and that does not make you a wise or a godly person. We're living in days where many churches have a form of godliness. But they deny its power to change the human heart. And that's why many of our denominational churches are dying. And I'm not saying that all denominations are bad. But those who have abandoned the Jesus of the Bible, they are withering away. People aren't coming. People aren't giving. People aren't serving. Some of these mainstream denominations have deceived themselves into thinking that if they just compromise with culture, that people will come to their churches. But listen, whatever you compromise to keep, you will lose in the long run. People aren't coming. And here's what hurts my heart. People are reaching out to us. And they're saying... We have been a part of our church for decades. We have worked. We have given. We have served. We love our church, but we also love the Word of God. And as we watch, so, so listen, this is not a criticism of church members. This is a criticism of church leaders who have no backbone. And people are saying to us, Listen, what are we to do? Because when we say, hey, we're not comfortable redefining marriage. We're not comfortable turning our back on doctrines that we have believed for decade after decade after decade. Do you know what happens to these people? They are often spiritually abused and manipulated. They are accused of being phobic and unloving. It is shameful what is being done to people who love the Lord. You know what people want today? There is a remnant of people who are hungry for the Lamb of God. Amen. Listen, y'all, we're not a perfect church. We got our faults. We mess up. We make mistakes. I'm not a perfect pastor. Hold your amens. <laughs> But listen, just, just think about it for a minute. How else could a ragtag group of people with almost nothing? We started with almost nothing. We start in a movie theater, we fill it up. Then we buy a building, we fill it up multiple times. And then we build a bigger building and we fill it up multiple times. How does that happen? There's no magic here. I, I'm no rock star preacher with perfect teeth and, and a great tan and a six-pack ab. Listen, listen, I don't even have abs. It was a genetic disorder. It, I, I don't, they're not even there. Like, I wasn't born with them, right? We, we still don't have a perfect building or a perfect set of circumstances. We're, we're rolling out a color-coded parking system to try to do our best today. But do you know what we have? We have the lamp. And when our worship team starts singing, we're going to do our best to point you to the Lamb. 
And when I stand behind this pulpit, I'm not going to spend 20 minutes talking to you about man-made theories. I'm not going to read you a poem that I found on the internet. I'm going to get behind the pulpit and I'm going to say, open up your Bibles to hear the Word of God. And together we're going to study the Word of God. But you know what we're doing the whole time? We're opening up our Bibles and studying the Word of God. We're looking for the Lamb, (laughs) y'all. All we do here is just lift up the Lamb. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Church, just keep looking to the Lamb. Just keep exalting Him. Just keep on worshiping Him. Listen, we're, we're, we're not the only church that sing good fruit in Garrett County. I don't want to say that at all. There are other faithful churches here in our county, and we're thankful for them. We encourage them. We are partners with them. But I need our church. I know this is not comfortable. I've wrestled all week. It's like, I don't really even want to give this message. I need our church to know there are people in our community using the name of Christ in ungodly ways. And it is not unloving for us to call out their error. It's one of our jobs. If any people gather in the name of Christ, then Christ is to be the focal point of that people. Anything else is idolatry. It's not worship. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Let's talk about some pronouns. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Preeminence means that Jesus is first importance in everything. He is first in honor. He is first in authority. He has the highest place of glory. He has the highest place of worship. He is first uh, in importance. Listen to me. Jesus does not need to be edited. Jesus does not need to be updated. Jesus does not need to be redefined. And he certainly doesn't need some new pronouns. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we exist, the church exists, to serve him, to honor him, and adore him. If you remove the Lamb, then you have no church at all. Someone give him praise and honor and glory today. And if you're listening online or on the radio today and your church has abandoned the word of God, we welcome you here. We welcome you here. And not just here. If if we're not a good fit for you, call us. We'll help you find another God-honoring church. There are lots of them in our county. We live in a beautiful place. There are lots of people here who love God. They love his word. And they are going to remain steadfast and faithful even when the culture runs off the edge of a cliff. If you need some help, we are here to help you. Will you stand with us, congregation? Let's pray. Father, we lift up those who are straying from your word. God, I ask you to convict their hearts. I pray that your Holy Spirit, God, would arrest their attention. Captivate them, God. Give them an experience like you gave Saul on the road to Damascus, God. Give them an experience that opens their eyes and helps them to see that they're wandering, God, that they are replacing the truth with lies. Father, we pray for them. Some of them are just lost. Some of them are just deceived. There are others who have evil and intentions. And God, we pray that you would reveal their hearts and that you would show those around them, God, exactly what is happening in their churches. God, we pray for our church. Help us, Lord, to love them well, 
to speak truth when it needs to be spoken, to do it in love. God, to be a blessing and a support. Help us to be a place that if people need to find a home, they can find a home here. Help us to be a people not distracted, God, by anything, but be captivated by the Lamb of God, the one who saved us, the one who loves us, the one who redeemed us, the one who shed his blood for us. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, this story written all the way back in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 22, that story is written there so you could find the Lamb. God provided his own son to die in your place. If that sacrifice has never become personal to you, I urge you today, talk to Jesus. If the Lord is talking to you, talk to him. Say yes to him. Open up your heart to him. Tell him that you need him. He's a good God. He doesn't turn people away. He has amazing, incredible grace. Father, we thank you and we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.